keynote speaker today. Um, an active recovery operator still, but um, big in training. He's the president of the IVR and a senior instructor. His operational background goes back over 50 years and is still operating today. He's an ITSAR Cat 4 instructor, a fellow to the IVR, International Federation of Recovery Specialists certified, Professional Record Operators of Florida certified, International Towing and Recovery Hall of Fame Museum inducted in 2012, a Recovery Demonstration Lead at MC for Professional Recovery Tow Shows and the IFBS in Castle. Uh, production trainer for the world's largest manufacturer in the world. Take a breath, Christ, I think you're busy. So for Boniface, he um, is that lead on the VTEC product, the Zizhay product, the Century, Vulcan, Holmes, Champion, Chevron, ITAN, and he's also TechSafe. Denmark and Ramsey Winch trainer. Nick Overton. Well, that was exhausting listening to that. I'm going to look up. I'm the one who's got a phone. Everyone can hear me out about you. Every time I get a mic on, I just want to sing. <laughs> uh, welcome to the graveyard shift. Thanks, Richard. Put me on last, and everybody's looking at their watch all really waiting to go again. Well, it's all yours is the most, well, the second most, well, the third most. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, back in whenever it was, a few months ago, I um, was asked to do a presentation at the uh, National Police Chiefs Conference. And this is a very similar presentation to what I did there. Um, some of you in here have kind of seen some of it before, and some have seen all of it before. But, you know, like Ian said, really, that it's kind of a different audience, and it's kind of a different message as well, because one of the things that we need to talk about is the, is the standard and the need for standards. And what I keep hearing is that it should be XYZ training or equivalent. But we need to forget about equivalents because what we need to know is that the standard is there. And, and, and I keep hearing about national occupational standards, which is a minimum standard. And every day in my inbox as an operator, not as anything to do with the IVR, is full of companies of offering me training. In particular, at the moment, it's electric vehicles because it's kind of a hot topic if you're fun. But what, the difference between the training, I can do a two hour online awareness course, or I can do a three day face to face course. Now, that standard cannot possibly be the same. If we look at what Dan and Ian have been talking about, is that what they're trying to get to make things right is across the board standard, so that we're all doing the same thing. I used to try and kind of make a comparison because a lot of people think the IVR delivers training. It doesn't. The IVR sets the standard, keeps up with other people within the industry. We've got a council of management that has volunteer people directly from recovery industry, many of them operators, some of them trainers, so that we can keep that information flowing going all the time, so that we always know that the standard that we're setting and the information that's given out to the trainers is current, and relevant. And one of the things particularly about electric vehicles is that most of those electric vehicle courses that you can get is about taking your orange plug out. Now, that is not necessary to recover a vehicle. What we need to know is what the pragmatic, practical approach is for recovery operators to be able to move that vehicle. The challenge is not electric shock. It's a bit of a challenge with fire, but really, that's their problem, not ours. The problems for us is that they're locked up, the wheels don't turn, and they're a lot heavier than their petrol counterparts. 
that's really where our, our training needs to need to be. Is that we're going out to that vehicle, we of course need to know what we can and can't take. But in terms of danger, if you think about a crashed petrol car, there's no more danger with an electric vehicle than there is with a petrol. Not really. So, you know, there are things that we need to know, and we're keeping up to speed with these guys all the time. And we've done a protocol, we've put a protocol together for recovering electric vehicles in particular that uh, the NFCC and UKRO have had an input into and are using that as part of their ongoing strategies as well. So, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that we're doing. So, all, all we need to know, that got, a friend of mine is a racing driver instructor, so he, he works at Cruxton Race Course, and he teaches people how to drive cars fast. You could say that that's a better level of training than you'd get from a driving instructor teaching somebody to drive on the road. This race car training doesn't cover him to drive on the road because nobody knows where the stand is. They don't know whether he's got awareness of traffic or any of that kind of stuff. So he still has to go and do his driving lessons and his driving test. And that's the same as this sector scheme standard that we're talking about so that we know but when he's got his certificate at the end of it, that he has reached that standard, however high or however low that is. And somebody coming to you and saying that they're training you better, it may be. But is it right? Does it contain the right amount? Or is it way too far advanced? Who knows? But what we need to do is have the standard. So just to quick, just quickly go through this. I have to tell you that when I did my presentation at the MPCC, I went five minutes over. Terry, I'm going to have to go out of This morning he went an hour over, so we're all playing the okay. So, no. yes. just, a, just a, a quick history about the IBR for those that don't know. So, founded in 1983, so we're now in our 40th year of existence. And uh, there's been some kind of references to, to Avro already today, but we came from Avro. So, Avro was, um, was kind of the first trade association. The IBR was born from that to set training standards, so back in those days. Still wholly owned by the members, there are no paid directors or shareholders. It's a not-for-profit organisation, a bit like my company. Not planned that way, but <laughs> <laughs> it ends up that way. Uh, managed by an elected council of management with, with a chairman that's uh, sitting down on this table this morning, this afternoon. So then, back in... Uh, 1996, IVRTS was formed, so that's IVR Training Services, to deliver training independently from the Institute of Vehicle Recovery. So we still have the standard set up, and then we had a separate company that was there to deliver training. And then back in the early 2000s, there was a, uh, an approach really about the highway sector scheme. And uh, Lance Williams sitting in the middle of the room there, it was kind of his baby for a long time. And there was, a, there was a requirement for a for a sector scheme, a national sector scheme, because during the roadworks recoveries, all it said in the contract was that that had to be suited for training. Well, there was a training course that was one day, and then there was another training course that was three days, but the certificate at the end of it was the same. It turned out that people were going out onto roadworks with recovery vehicles and had absolutely no idea how to operate it because they'd never done it. They knew in the book how it should be not actually how to do it. So, in 2006, when we finally got the um, <coughs> administer, administrator's job for that sector scheme, we then formed IVR UK. So, IVR UK is the administrator of sector scheme 17. So, IVR does not deliver modular training to the recovery industry. So, all the modules that you'll see in a minute from the IVR are not delivered all delivered by independent training providers that are approved by IVR, which that ensures their fair marketplace competition. So it's not kind of one person delivering everything. So the sector scheme was produced for highways England and police forces to include in their contract. So early on, um, it sits on a ISO framework and builds on PAS 43. So PAS 43 is a specification not a standard. So a lot of people say you've got to 
conform to patch 43 standard. It is not standard. NHSS 17 and 17B is the recognised industry standard for recovery vehicle training. So the initial training requirements for the sector scheme was a nationally, nationally recognised training qualification, an easily recognised ID card system, one administrator to hold the national database, now called the Professional Register, and issue the certification. Uh, must be a modular training system that has individual skills tests and exams for all the students, minimum standard for trainers and training providers, and one standard for all training that's a rocket vehicle. Okay? It's not rocket science, and it comes back to exactly what these guys have been saying, that it's that continual learning to show that we are all on the same page when we're out on the road. Not way up there and way down there, but it's, we've got that standard. So initial working parties back in those days was, of course, the, the sector scheme that was headed by the heart. Uh, Highways Agency, as it was then, which is now National Highways, um, survived. ACPO, which is now the MPCC. The NRITG, the National Recovery Industry Training Group, which consisted of IBR, Avro, Triple R. RO, RTA, IFRS, uh, RHA, RRG, which doesn't exist, and the WRTA, which is the Trainers Association. So, <coughs> the modules kind of start down at the core modules, which is one, two, and three, kind of the important one, really, more about safety at the roadside. Um, so, they're all mandatory. So, there's two days to get those three modules. You then go to light recovery technician, so depending on what equipment they use, what vehicle they've got, they can pick which one of those modules that they need. Uh, the motorcycle modules, again, are different. The heavy modules, there's quite a few of those, depending on <coughs> what kind of truck they drive and what they do. Additional modules, such as uh, lorry loader cranes, we've now got tracked vehicle movers, like the East Tracker, things like that. So all kind of separate ones. The ideal ones for police contracts, uh, it's the core modules, I mean, six or five, whichever they slide better or whatever. Preservation of evidence now is an important one, and that is in most police contracts now. Insist on one, two, and three, and 19. And it's getting to the stage now where they're asking for 27 as well, which is the electric vehicle awareness one. One of the important parts about the VR27 now is about monitoring the temperature of the, of the high voltage battery. So a lot of people believe that when you pull the orange plug out, incidentally now, a lot of the newer electric vehicles don't have that big orange plug out. Because they kind of got fed up with people taking them out. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's called a service disconnect plug. It's a service in the high voltage system. Taking the orange plug out does not get rid of the high voltage. The high voltage is always there. It also doesn't get rid of the risk of fire. As long as those lithium ion batteries are they have been damaged or get damaged or compromised, that's where the fire risk is. So disconnecting the high voltage does not stop any of that. Is that right, boys? So the standards for the module then. Um, we have a maximum amount of students for each course. So it's 10 students on the kind of core modules because they're classroom based. But all the practical modules is a maximum of four students for each. That's where this standard differs from a lot of the other training that's on offer. Because there's some other people that will do these modules here online. The problem with doing it online, I mean, if you can imagine the, the levels of standard that Dan was talking about, standards of training, can you imagine a guy turning up as a firefighter and has done a two hour online course and now wants to be a firefighter because he's got a qualification? We not dream of it, will we? It does that. We, exactly. And it shouldn't happen. It does. But it can because we keep saying, oh, it only needs to be trained. And as long as it complies with the national occupational standards, it's okay. It is. We need to have a standard and a level. Uh, all modules need to be fresh, refreshed after five years. So you know, they've all got a kind of a, a five year expiration date. Incidentally, there's some people within the industry, as in the transport or vehicle industry, that are asking for that to be cut down to three years. 
and that amount of students on a course, they're also trying to change that from four to three. We've tried to keep it at four because it kind of works better when you're an even number and you're doing vehicle recovery exercises, works better than a long number does. But, you know, we've kind of got the standard, people are trying to get the standard lower, the people that understand it are trying to get it higher, so it's a shorter period rather than a longer one. So the technicians must be registered with IBIDK. Um, they will have a unique digital card that records all of their qualifications that they have taken. And that can be read by a uh, phone app or scan or whatever. You can only get that card after you've completed the R1, the R2, the R3. Okay, and then after that, you can get the card updated. That also has a five-year duration. Trainers, the trainer standard is that they must be registered and approved by the UK. They must have an ITSAR instructor qualification. So ITSAR is the Independent Training Standards Scheme and Register. So it's a completely separate thing. It's externally audited and accredited. So it's not just kind of like, back in the day it was jobs for the boys really, that you know, we you had was some prominent recovery operators that were doing the training because we didn't really have any other way of doing that. So what they now have to have is relevant industry experience <coughs> to go through that cat line constructive qualification. They must be trained and qualified in all of the relevant modules. So anything they want to teach, they must have their own operator qualification in that module. Two years risk and recovery experience. Uh, must undergo refresher training every five years, so both ITSAR and IBR. Attend update workshops as required. They're normally annually, sometimes more than that. If there's a big change in, in any of the modules or anything, then there'll be an immediate workshop that the uh, instructors must attend. Currently, there are 20 level one instructors. So they would be normally internal instructors in inside big companies, such as Ravenscroft or whatever. Level one training that would deliver uh, induction training to their guys so that they can get them bums and seats and turn it out or over them. Normally we'll only deliver the core modules over. Uh, level two, so their external truck instructors can deliver anything that they're qualified in. It's currently 28 of those. External training providers, the 32 of those. Uh, internal training providers, 17. And the number of non-recovery industry training providers, such as truck manufacturers, tire dealers and colleges, etc. There's four of those. So there's, you know, there's plenty of training availability. What's happened since COVID is that there's a massive backlog and uh, it, it can be difficult to get on the course. I keep hearing people that can't get a course and I talk to a few in, the instructors, did they phone you? No, they didn't. So you know, what they're doing is going to their preferred supplier, they can't provide you, but they're not going elsewhere to look for it. So it ends up as a bit of scare money. There are all the current modules, there's 32 of them. Um, nobody would need to do every single one of those. It just depends on what they do within the industry. So, for instance, there, there's a compound manager one down here, VR30. That is mainly net police. So it was kind of designed for them, um, mainly because they had recovery operators that were going into their compounds to pick stuff up. And there was all kinds of dodgy experiences out there. Like cars being driven off the top of multi-car transporters land on their roofs and all that kind of stuff. So we put a course together for them, but we now, like me as a company, have a, have a compound manager or a, a yard man, as we kind of tend to be nearly call them, um, and they can do that the R30. So, you know, it's, a, it's available for anybody. That particular one is one that's only delivered, though, by, by the RTS, because it's not viable, really. It's not enough external training providers to have. Clear and overturn vehicles there is pretty unique really to um, national highways for their traffic officers. So that's about getting stuff out of light lanes and stuff. But everything else there is kind of is there really for recovery operators. So we currently have this uh, RQM card, so the, the unique identity card. That's been updated in recent years actually in the last couple of years. And uh, that can be checked 
at the roadside and is checked by the roadside by traffic officers. So, and it could, there's no reason why it couldn't be done by police officers and indeed by fire and rescue people. That if they've got somebody there and they think, they don't look quite right what you're doing there, that they can kind of actually say, have you got garbage here? You can check his credentials and make sure that they're doing what they are trying to do. And if they're not trying for that piece of equipment, then maybe you could call that in and say, yeah, I don't think this is safe. Um, also, so Lantra <coughs> um, are an accrediting body, and of all the sector schemes there are, I'm not sure how many, do you know how many lance off the top of your head, how many sector schemes there are? Off the top of my head, about 25. And so, am I right in thinking that nearly all of those others are administered by Lantra, apart from 17 that's administered by the other? They, they, they manage probably seven. That are relevant to, to that kind of thing. So what I'm about to say then is not strictly true in that actual administrators for all of the national highways in the north. There are administrators for seven. Um, but IVR UK is the administrator for sector scheme 17. Um, all of the main VR modules now though are Lantra approved, so externally accredited now as well. So you know you you get in IPR are putting it together. The instructors are all externally accredited by ITSAR, and all of the courses now are externally accredited by Lantra. So what that does is kind of takes away this accusation about us being um, homework set around marker, that it is all externally accredited. And all for the right reasons as well. We need to be reminded of really is that IBR is not a training provider. It's a standard setter. An administrator. Um, it has independent approved training companies that deliver the training, nationwide training centres, real life practical training with individual skills tests. That's the important part. That they're coming along, they're learning how to do the job. At the end of it, they have to show by way of a skills test that they can actually do it. It's focused on recovering vehicles with zero extra damage and preserving evidence, particularly for police contracts. But it's important that we're not dragging these vehicles around and sticking extra damage on them that could then um, compromise the amount of evidence that's around there. The training is updated as necessary according to new vehicle technology, whatever that be. New cars that are coming out on new recovery equipment. Uh, regular trainer workshops independently accredited training, independently qualified trainers, a tried and tested scheme, so the NHSS scheme has been running now since 2006. And I'll be right in saying, Lance, that all of the time constraints that were set to get those modules up and running, we exceeded every single one of those. So we're, it had to be running within a year, and it was, everything was done. And that was nearly all done by volunteers that were kind of just kind of putting their time in around the clock to, to make sure it happened, rather than just doing it because they were creating the money. And above all, really, the thing to remember is it's not for profit organisation, it's there for the better of the industry, to make sure that we've got the right standard and that that's delivered properly to the industry. Bang on, Tom, what about that? <laughs> thanks for your time, thanks for Can I have a copy of your presentation? Yes, absolutely. One thing you ought to mention, Nick, is that the LVR received no funding whatsoever for any of that. For you what? For putting that together over the last 12, 14 years. For the, for the sector scheme? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no funding from anyone. And no contract or guarantee either that it's going to continue. But what kind of concerns us a little bit, what we keep getting is things levelled at us that it's, uh, it's a monopoly and that kind of stuff. It isn't. It's a standard. It's a bit like DVLA, if you like, that <coughs> set the standard for the driving test but don't deliver it. They're not the people that go out and see people that drive. They have other people that do that. But they sit at the top and they issue the licence. And that's kind of where we set the standard. That's the standard that needs to be delivered. And that 
that's the result at the end of it. Here's your decision, certificate, congratulations. <coughs> so, to be honest, Nick, sorry, but to be honest, well, I think the time to come to sort of like stop, for the IVR, stop looking over its shoulder and to stop justifying its, its existence, if you like. You asked me to come do this. <laughs> <laughs> because I want there to be standards and I want us to show our strategic partners that we're going to have standards and that we've got standards and like I said you're probably the fourth most important presentation today <laughs> but it's an important part of what we do and you will be the IVR will be the integration into all of you they'll be trained, helping training with you with the client with you whatever and you're an integral part of it and so, be concerned about level stuff that's being leveled. If you see the stuff that's being leveled about me, um, my therapist says, don't worry about it. <laughs> Soon that cops will get sick of it. <laughs> but but what, what I just want to try and say to you is that I've had these big, having these conversations. I, I had them with um, National Highways um, last week with, 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 with Nick Harrison and other people because. They've got them, in, they've got them on, you have to have them to have the FMG contract and things like that. And it's time people accepted the, the valuable work that you do, probably the amount of lives that you save, what you're dedicated into actually doing. Right? And be proud of that instead of having to justify itself. And I'm proud that you're one of our partners, and I'm proud of what you've done in this industry, and so may it continue. Yeah, well, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, wouldn't uh, a simple, so, well it's not a simple solution, but a solution would be for all the work providers, whether you know, the Met Police or the RAC or an insurance company, whoever it is, to agree a standard. So then we train to. And, um, We've got it. It is agreed. Set to scheme 17. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Met Police do. But the problem go, leading on from that is you've got work providers out there that don't dictate that you need to have that and that's the problem isn't yeah. it? So how do we get to that? Well, the ones that don't agree with it are, are the ones that are, are thinking that the IVR is a training provider versus another provider. And they, they keep making a, um, like a connection between the two that this is now a, a competitor for the IVR. It isn't. It's a competitor for the training providers all should be kind of fighting against it, but the standard is there, and, it, and it's a standard that's accepted. And so, you know, we do via the IVR, we do a bit of work with HSE, because what you don't know is how many recovery vehicle-related accidents there are on an annual basis, and it's a lot. You know, if you think how big the country is, and we're approached all the time by different police forces different organisations that want to know what should have been done in this situation where somebody's been hurt. Okay. And what they keep saying is, you know, we, what keeps being said is that you don't need the sector scheme unless you do highways work. That is not true. It's now the benchmark. So that's where it is. And if you're not complying with it, you need to prove that you're complying with something better. And that's impossible to do unless it complies to a standard. You know, and it comes back to that thing I said about their driving license. Right? My mate will teach you how to get round Thruxton quick, but he, he's not teaching you what to do when you get a set of traffic lights and there's traffic coming from each direction. And you still have to go and get that driving license, don't you? Yeah. So his, his standard of driver training is way above anything else, but it still ain't good enough for what we need. And it's not rocket science. And, it, and I think from, from police forces point, it's easy for them to say, but there's a standard, meet it. You know, instead of saying, oh, well, he's got an electric vehicle, but I'm not really sure what this means. It just says EV awareness. Right? What does that mean? It doesn't mean that he can now go and pick up a Tesla with all four wheels popped up, does it? And it which is what you mean. You need to know that that's what he can do. You might be able to pull the plug on it, which hasn't got. So, you know. But he can do a Nissan Leaf, because that's got one. Yeah. You know, it just, it, training is not training if it doesn't meet a standard. The standard is the bit that tells whether it's good enough. And these people need to know 
that we meet a standard. Because otherwise, they've got no faith. Hey, somebody's coming along going, oh yeah, I think I can do that and pull that plug out. Yeah, what do you do? I can't move it because it's not there. <coughs> it's there. 